Welcome to the lecture on urbanization between 1870 and 1920. This would be lecture 18. By about 1890, we've got sort of the modern America that we know of today, urban-wise. Uh, most of American history so far to this point had been pretty rural, uh, based around farming, small communities. But increasingly, the life of the city is dominating people's thought and people's discussions. Um, and you start seeing uh, downtown areas with rings of suburbs developing in major urban areas, both in the north and the south. And that's pretty much going to be the pattern, well, up until now, um, the whole suburbia sort of thing, which will have a second major growth um, in the 1950s with the creation of the modern suburbs. As cities grew, they had to solve a lot of problems, uh, like sanitation. What do you do with all these people and their wastes? Um, how do you process that? How do you get that out of the way? Providing social services. Uh, when you've got so many people crammed in a small amount of space, how do you take care, care of issues of poverty and disease? And what do you do to make sure that um, you know, city life is working well for everyone. Public safety becomes an issue. Uh, the crime rate in the United States skyrockets by the end of the 19th century, and cities have to develop what we would think of now as a modern police force, even though in the 1890s, uh, police departments were generally pretty stupid um, from our point of view in terms of how to solve crimes. Uh, but they are needed because, you know, there's so much criminal activity going on with so many people concentrated in small amounts of space. Um, in fact, we can calculate that, um, and there's a 300% increase in the murder rate by 1900. So city life um, is exciting, it's wonderful, it offers all kinds of new opportunities, but it's also dangerous and dirty. And deadly. Um, one of the problems that cities have to deal with as they grow is all of the ways in which they're going to move people, deal with energy sources, um, provide people with water, all the things that you don't normally think about when you're living on the farm and there's like a river nearby or creek. So as cities grow they have to lay down sewers um, gas lines, water supplies, the development of electricity, do you have lights, um, transportation, railways, streetcars, um, systems of lighting. Um, it even places uh, like here in Columbus um, had to deal with that. Um, there was an interurban railway system that allowed people to travel through town um, and that interurban came into Bexley. Um, as Bexley residents um, in the early 20th century were deciding you know how to pave their streets how to pay for that how to make sure there was a clean water supply uh, where do you get that water from where do you dump the wastes from people's houses all of these things have to be solved and fixed as cities grow and then the suburbs grow around them cities therefore are highly crowded after 1865 and we can quantify that crowding. Migration into cities, both from European migrants as well as people from the countryside, make cities seven times more crowded um, after the Civil War. On the plus side, cities concentrating so many people in such a small space uh, can generate the surplus money needed um, and the surplus support for cultural institutions like museums, libraries, and parks. And you see many of our well-known museums and libraries and parks today getting built in the 1890s, early 1900s. 
Uh, so, for example, in Columbus, our own Franklin Park takes off in the 1890s. Um, museums get built to showcase art collections uh, by wealthy donors. Um, so you start seeing those. Uh, libraries are being built so that the children and families of these communities can access uh, to books and reading materials. So I thought I would show you pictures of Columbus since um, it you know, fits in this time period. And basically after the 1890s, uh, Columbus's population starts increasing as the areas around Columbus begin to industrialize. Um, and here's a picture of the famous Union Station uh, where people would ride into town via the trains and then get off and you know, make their way into Columbus itself. Um, you can see streetcars here uh, bringing people uh, up and down the streets. At the same time, people are still using horses for transportation, um, horse-drawn carriages and buggies. Major U.S. city growth um, can be seen in this chart if you're a numbers kind of person. Uh, you could even calculate the percent change if you're interested in doing that. Um, New York by 1860 is the leading city, 1.1 million, then 1.9 million, but 1900, look at that, 3.4 million. Not far behind is Philly, 565 to 847 to 1.2 million, and then Boston, Baltimore, Cincinnati. Between 1880 and 1900, there is phenomenal, fantastic growth um, in urbanization in the United States. Another scene uh, from Columbus, the city of Arches, the Arch City, which uh, were originally in the short north and then uh, came back. Uh, you can see once again businesses here, uh, people both using streetcars as well as horse-drawn transportation in the early 20th century. This is an illustration of one of the transportation facilities that became well known. It was Washington, D.C.'s Union Station. It was the train station that opened in 1908 uh, to sort of bring people in and move them around uh, through the town. Um, the emphasis was on building a beautiful, imposing, modern structure uh, with all these um, sort of lovely throwbacks to uh, Greek and Roman architecture, big archways, you know, massive uh, white sort of to suggest cleanliness uh, with people being able to ride into town and then take off and go anywhere they want to. But on the same hand, um, as these grand pictures suggest, there is a dirtier side to cities. And the dirtier side was things like, you know, sewage waste, trash pickup, things that we all take for granted, but they had to be worked out in the 20th century. Most people tossed their trash on the side of the street, and the city had to contract people to come by and pick it up. Sometimes it wasn't picked up, and no one would be contracted for it or cities couldn't afford, and so there would be rotting piles of garbage on the sides of many streets. As populations increased inside of cities, so did the numbers of people looking for handouts and charity and begging wealthy folks as they walked down the street uh, for help. Uh, these folks, uh, like this person here holding the sign that says, I was blowed up, uh, become the modern panhandlers um, that we now associate with urban areas. The wealthy, however, could escape. And so they might have fantastic mansions in the cities, like the Vanderbilt mansions that I showed you in the previous lecture, 
But in the summer, they don't have to stay in the city. They can take off to Europe. Um, they can go to summer houses in the Hamptons on the coast and enjoy clean, fresh air away from the stench and the nastiness of the hot city life in the summer. Cities, as far as safety goes, were prone to one particular problem in the uh, 19th and 20th century, and that was fire. The lack of building codes, the lack of professional fire agencies, uh, made for very dangerous situations, such as when Chicago caught fire in 1871, um, and large portions of the town burned. Fires could be devastating as they swept through impoverished neighborhoods and raced up shoddily built um, construction, um, forcing people out, uh, resulting in a lot of deaths, um, and then leaving behind ruined lives and ashes. Despite all those horrific things that I just mentioned, the cities of America seemed like a haven of opportunity, a place where you could make it and be somebody if you were an immigrant, like these folks here, who have braved all of the horrible things that could happen to them, left their homeland in search of a better life in the United States. In fact, between 1890 and 1920, there are about 23 million migrants to the United States, dramatically increasing the U.S. population. Most of them were new migrants, and that meant that they were different from the old migrants that Americans were used to. New migrants were largely from Eastern and Southern Europe. They were Polish, Czechoslovakian, Romanian, Russian, Greek, Italian. They didn't look like the Irish of old. They didn't look like the Germans that everybody had known. They didn't look English. They weren't like the old immigrants that people had been used to since the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And those old immigrants fit into the culture of America fairly well whereas these new migrants did not. The new migrants were fleeing religious persecution, they were seeking economic opportunity just like the old migrants were, but uh, when they came to America, they brought uh, a lot of religious traditions, languages, cultures, food ways, and things that were seen as strange by most Americans. One group of people that was especially singled out in the West Coast would have been Asian migrants. Uh, in this time period, there are about 500,000 Chinese and Japanese migrants to the United States. And they, too, are seen as a threat. They're seen as dangerous, culturally unable to mix and fit in. Um, they are not going to be welcomed. Uh, by a lot of Americans. One of the reasons that they're seen as a problem is that they would increasingly take the unskilled, low-paying jobs, which white workers in the United States said was driving down wages. The more migrants who came, the lower the value of labor. When these migrants settled in their ethnic communities so that they could be near other Polish-speaking people, other Romanians, other Czechoslovakians, that further isolated them from the rest of the United States. Many Americans saw them with a suspicious eye, thinking these communities of you know, Polish-speaking Jews, for example, were somehow clannish and secretive and not wanting to mix in with everybody else. They crammed themselves into some of the worst housing conditions we can imagine. And all of that, they endured all of the mistreatment, all of the things thrown at them, all of the poor housing conditions 
just so they could have a better life and a better opportunity for their children. This is just a chart showing the new migration. So between 1861 and 1880, still European, um, Irish, German, English dominates 69%. Up till 1900, it's still 51%. But between 1900 and 1920, this Polish, Russian, Hungarian, Eastern European uh, contingent combined with a Greek and Italian contingent flood into American cities and Americans feel overwhelmed by migrants that they don't understand, speaking languages they don't get, bringing cultures and religious traditions and foods um, that Americans don't particularly understand. Here's another chart illustrating the same statistics in another way. So 1860-1900, you can break it down, Italian, German, British, Irish, um, and you can see that Italians, uh, Russians, uh, Baltic state folks make up a much bigger proportion um, than people in this time period did. Where did they settle? Largely cities. Coastal cities in the south um, were okay destinations for many migrants, um, but if you really wanted to make an opportunity and a new life for yourself, most of them settled in the northern cities, places where there was big industry, where there were low-wage, uh, low-skilled jobs that they could take. So places like Chicago, Kansas City, Philly, New York, Boston, those became the general destination of almost all the migrants. All of American industrialization um, is concentrated roughly here. Now some who aren't going to work in factories we're going to see do migrate out to the west. A lot of Swedes, Scandinavians, and other migrants end up trying to homestead and make a life for themselves on the western plains. And you can see that in this map here. Um, immigrants do show up in Wisconsin, Minnesota, this area out here where it's 30% and over. Most migrants do not go south and that's generally because there's very little labor for them. It's all being done already by white southerners um, and sharecropping African Americans. So here's a street scene um, showing just how crowded these streets were with all of these people. Um, one of the things that you would have seen in this time period in the 1890s, early 1900s, would have been street vendors selling food and clothing and all kinds of things right on the side of the street. Um, the streets themselves would be packed uh, with carts and horses and people moving along. Um, of course, we don't see that as much now unless there's like a street market or a farmer's market along a street. Or if you go into some of the ethnic neighborhoods in major cities um, like Philadelphia um, or New York. What kind of jobs did most of the immigrants have? Most of them ended up somewhere in the clothing trades, a lot of tailors, a whole lot of people working on sewing and clothing. Bakers form a large group, miners, quarrymen, barbers, carpenters, salesmen, physicians, very few people in the professional realm in terms of uh, migrants. A lot harder for migrants to break into the professional world. So with these cities being full of problems and difficulties, there are reformers who try to work on those issues and try to make America better, safer, cleaner. They attack the reforms from a lot of different angles. Some of the reformers thought that the problem was solely one of too many immigrants. And so in the 1880s and 90s, we see a rise in nativism 
again. And the solution that these reformers proposed was just simply restricting the migrants. If the cities are crowded with people we don't like and don't understand, let's just enact, let's enact literacy tests. Let's restrict the entry of these people, and that way the problem will be solved. Many of these nativists were explicitly anti-Catholic because a lot of the migrants were Catholic. They were Italian. Um, some of them were Catholics from Greece, Catholics from Eastern Europe. Um, some of them are um, anti-Semitic as well because many of the Russian and Polish migrants are Jews. So one reform solution is simply stop the migrants altogether. Another reform solution that's a little bit more charitable uh, and welcoming would have been the social gospel. The social gospel aimed to provide social services to the poor and migrants through food kitchens, through uh, providing shelters for people, through reaching out to people in your community and trying to help them have a better life, get them jobs, try to help them move up in the world. Um, social gospel comes out of uh, Protestant Christianity. One of the leading folks behind it actually was a preacher here in Columbus. The Reverend Washington Gladden um, was a preacher at First Congregational Church, and he attacked uh, liquor in Columbus, um, the fact there was too many saloons, too much drinking. He attacked corruption. He wanted to help the poor. Um, a lot of the people who belonged to his church actually were some of the founders of Bexley, and they carried his ideas um, into their operations as businessmen to try to hire people and improve the lives of others. Many of them served on local charity organizations to try to make um, the, the area better and cleaner and safer. One group of reformers actually provided places for the poor and migrants to go called settlement houses. One of the most famous settlement houses was Hull House in Chicago, led by Jane Addams. And this place would have offered people education, daycare, adult learning, um, ways of helping people get out of their poverty by providing them the tools for a better life. Um, and you could take classes in all sorts of things, like how to shake hands and greet people in the American way. Um, classes in cooking, sanitation, um, keeping a home. There were literacy classes, citizenship classes. All of these were designed to help the poor and migrants assimilate and be more successful in American society. One reformer attacked these issues by exposing the horrible conditions that the poor and migrants lived in. He himself was a migrant. Jacob Rees uh, migrated to the United States uh, from Denmark and became a reporter and published in 1890 a book called How the Other Half Lives, in which he paired descriptions of life in tenement houses with pictures of actual people. So he documented what it was like in these dirty, dangerous, and poor living situations, um, showing that in many cases it concentrated 700 people in one acre in some places in New York. So you could actually open the book and see this horrific situation. Reese's goal was that people would see this and then they'd be motivated to fix it and to do better and try to solve the problems. So uh, here's Washington Gladden and there is Jane Addams. A lot of the debate about immigrants centered around did they bring dangerous diseases and poverty and other problems that would be a threat to the United States. Some people worried they might be bomb-throwing anarchists, communists, socialists and that the U.S. could not simply uh, allow them to come in because it would taint 
uh, American life and culture. Israel Zangwill saw immigration differently and talked about how immigrants came and melted into the great melting pot of American life and they brought their distinctiveness with them but flavored this great national stew of all these diverse peoples. So there's a lot of divergent opinions about migration even in this time and we still have uh, these divergent opinions going on today. So nothing new under the sun I guess. Here's a cartoon suggesting how the migration problem might be solved with Asians. The uh, Asians and the Irish are simply going to swallow up Uncle Sam um, and then the Chinese are going to eat the Irish. Problem solved. This cartoonist takes a look at the fact that America's newly rich robber baron industrialists were themselves migrants and that in their histories, in their pasts, were poor migrating people who came to America for the promise of a better life. So who are these guys to say no to this new migrant? Why he might be the next robber baron one day. And again, maybe that's what he is actually afraid of. Pictures from Jacob Reese's book here uh, are some tenement boys um, sleeping in a small little section. Um, notice they're barefoot, uh, wearing ragged clothes. Chances are good they are, you know, unhealthy, diseased kids suffering from any number of ailments and disorders. Probably having to work for a living just to keep, you know, their families. Um, in better circumstances, many of them sold newspapers, shine shoes. If you're a fan of the musical Newsies, Newsies kind of glamorizes the life of these you know, street urgents just a bit. And there's Jacob Reese. This is what a tenement looked like. It's basically an apartment building. Um, these tenements were called dumbbell tenements because if you look at the shape, it looks kind of roughly like a dumbbell if you're you know lifting weights the thought process behind it was that there'd be an air shaft in the middle and air would go down and circulate and be able to keep the whole thing kind of clean it didn't work in fact it was a terrible idea air could never really get into these shaft areas very well um, Sunlight could only get down to the bottom of the shaft at one point in the day, noon. The rest of the time, your sunlight's going to be angled, either come in angling towards you or angling away from you. So this whole shaft business did not work out as people thought. Notice that there were um, several rooms in a tenement house, usually a parlor living room. Um, cooking would go on here, separate bedrooms, public water closets or restrooms that people would have to share. Here's one of the air shafts. You can see just how narrow it is and there's no way air is going to circulate down in there. You'd have to have a gust of wind blowing straight down and then straight back up for that to really even be effective. Buildings were haphazardly thrown together, um, catty corner to each other, or catty wampus as we say sometimes in the south. Um, so you get these little dark areas where who knows what's going on. Crime, violence, prostitution, drugs, filth, you name it. Um, no building codes until the early 20th century. So some of these were shoddy and terribly built, dangerous death traps. Um, dangerous death traps indeed. Here we see a fire inspector looking um, at one of these tenements. Notice how crowded and nasty it is. The ceiling's about to collapse in. You live and eat in the same room where you cook.
This is an interesting photograph of the number of people sleeping in a tenement house, sleeping around their heat and cook source, um, just counting feet. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve people in this one room. Maybe even more that we can't see out of the picture. Streets in these uh, tenement areas were very, very poorly maintained. So here these kids play next to the body of a decomposing horse. Yum. Here is a tenement toilet. Just imagine sitting on that. Here is another tenement toilet and a family living in a tenement. Look how crowded it is. People also worked out of their tenement houses. They would take in sewing jobs or cigar making jobs, cigar rolling jobs, and work from inside the tenement house. And often the whole family would have to work. This mother with these two kids uh, her face pretty much says says it all for this life. It's just sheer exhaustion. And I've always loved this little picture. These kids huddled up together. They don't even have separate beds. There's like one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And then one of them has a little kitten. Notice they're outside on the fire escape. This is outside of the window. And another uh, group of people sleeping all together. Stove right here nearby. All huddled up. All those pictures should tell you just how awful their lives must have been back in Europe for them to come to America and see America as a better place. So what are middle class folks doing? Well, they're just buying everything in sight. Because by the 1890s, we get the creation of a mass consumer culture with mass produced goods. Meaning you can buy the same products all over the United States. You can buy them at department stores, which are being created in this time period. Indoor shopping mall areas, which are created in this time period. Advertising increases dramatically to several million dollars a year. It becomes a big business to encourage people to buy products. People are starting to work less, so we see a decline in the work day, and that leaves for the middle class a lot of leisure time. So what are they going to occupy themselves with? When your work week goes from 70 hours a week in 1870 to, 19, to 60 hours a week in 1900, you fill it with trips to the park strolling among the pleasant lanes of Franklin Park, for example, theaters, going to the pub and having a pint or 12. But the hot new thing to do in this time period is spectator sports. After the Civil War, we get the rise of boxing in the United States, baseball, the invention of basketball, um, football, all of these spectator sports um, become ways of people occupying their time. Golf starts to take hold in the U.S. and people pay more attention uh, to going out and golfing. Exercise, bicycle riding, all of those things become popular uh, by the 1890s. Here is the cheapest supply house in the world, Sears Roebuck and Company. The Sears catalog was basically one of the most long sought after um, re pieces of reading material for many a child in this time period. 
to sit and look through this catalog and see all the wonderful things that you could order by mail. Sears would basically ship you anything, including a house. You could actually buy the plans and materials for a house, a whole house. Um, Sears today actually maintains a website with all the house plans on it, so you can look through and see what people used to buy. Parks became important in this time period. So in Columbus, we have Franklin Park, Olentangy Park. Uh, we get um, the rise of places to go for amusements. Across from Franklin Park, uh, for a while near East High School today, there was a circular gravity railway, which we would call a roller coaster now. Um, in Coney Island, um, there would be Luna Park, uh, New York. So people would be attracted to go see this wondrous um, evening of amusements. City life might have been dirty. It might have been fun. It might have been exciting. It was also corrupt. Most of the cities at this time period are run by urban bosses or networks of urban bosses who basically control all the politics in the town. Um, even Bexley, according to one of Bexley's former mayors, um, his predecessor told him basically he ran everything, he did everything. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they rule badly. A guy can be in control of everything and still do good things, but when you have an urban boss who sees his control over the city as an excuse to line his own pockets, then you can get massive corruption. Um, these urban bosses controlled city jobs, they controlled city funds, they basically, on the positive side, did employ migrants created a social safety net by spending large amounts of money on building projects. On the negative side, they did take public money for themselves and they were very corrupt um, in making sure that only their friends got jobs in the city. The most notorious would have been Boss Tweed, who basically ran New York as his sort of personal playground from 1852 to 1872. He stole somewhere between 25 and 45 million dollars from the state uh, and the people of New York. 25 and 45 million, that's a lot of money. Patronage, though, was not just a city problem, it was kind of a natural, national problem. There was corruption everywhere, and it ran all the way up to the presidency. Political parties controlled jobs and basically demanded loyalty to the party as a price of the job. In fact, they went so far as to say, once you got a job, you're supposed to turn over part of your salary to back to the political party as sort of a thank you to the party for getting you the job. So it's a pretty dirty, rotten system. Um, and it actually cost a president his life. In 1881, a job seeker who had some serious mental issues actually assassinated President Garfield when Garfield didn't give him the job that he wanted. Um, and so the disappointed office seeker just shot the president. By 1883, the U.S. government had passed a Civil Service Act, the Pendleton Civil Service Act, that gave tests as a requirement to get a federal government job. So this corruption, this spoil system created by Andrew Jackson could be limited. Now at first, it only included about 10% of government jobs, but eventually, by 1897, it covered about 50% of all government jobs, uh, federal government jobs. Uh, so the spoil system doesn't go away, but it is being chipped away in order to try to create a more efficient and honest political system. Here's some cartoons of Boss Tweed, not shown in a pretty flattering light. Here's a vulture. Here, who stole the people's money and everybody's pointing fingers at somebody else.
but Boss Swede is, you know, the large guy in charge. Literally the large guy in charge. Uh, because he controlled voting, um, basically as long as he counted the ballots, pretty much he and all of his cronies are going to win. Um, his guys would grow beards, go vote, shave a little bit, go vote again, shave a little bit more, go vote again, finally shave everything off and vote again. So Tweed always won. As long as I count the votes, what are you going to do about it? After Tweed is gone, bosses don't go away, um, but they have to sort of like keep a lower profile. And New York for a while is under the control of Boss Croker. So here is Croker, the orbiting star around which all these other New Yorkers um, are caught in his gravity well. Here is a cartoon showing uh, the disappointed office seeker, Charles Guiteau, who shot Garfield. Um, he actually stalked Garfield for months before he finally shot him. There's Garfield and Guiteau. Guiteau really did have mental problems. He was convinced uh, that he had like, basically personally elected Garfield as president. He determined that Garfield should reward him by making him an ambassador. Today, we'd probably speculate that he had some form of schizophrenia. 